Hi folks, and welcome to IncoTerms 2020 webinar. I'm Nick Esposito, TRG's Business Development Manager, and I'll be your host today. Presenting today is Meredith Lambert, who is TRG's Marketing Manager. I think most of you will probably recognize her from the handiwork on the HTSUS lookup tool from our tariff webinars. This webinar is being presented by Trade Risk Guarantee. We're located in the heart of downtown Bozeman, Montana. If you're ever in town, don't forget to stop by our shared office space on the second floor of the historic Rocking Arm Bar building. TRG operates on a direct importer business model that is unique to the international trade community. As an important disclaimer, the information presented in this webinar is for information purposes only and is not intended, and does not constitute legal advice. We will be recording this webinar. It'll be available on YouTube for future reference. I'll drop a link in the chat to subscribe to the channel in a little bit. If you have any questions during the presentation, submit them via the questions section of the webinar. The questions will be reviewed and answered by myself or our team of licensed customs brokers shortly after the webinar. If you have any additional questions outside the webinar or if you'd like to be part of a community of trade professionals, join our Facebook group, International Trade Professionals hyphen TRG. We frequently check the group for questions and encourage our members to start conversations amongst themselves if they have a common problem. All right, let's hand it over to Meredith to kick off the webinar. Okay, well, thank you, Nick, and hello, everybody. Um, as Nick mentioned, I am Meredith. I will be walking us all through some of the some of the new things that have come out for IncoTerms 2020. Um, although, uh, as an additional disclaimer, this topic can be very complex, and the details of how a specific rule applies to your business situation is very dependent on many aspects of your supply chain. So today we're gonna cover an overview to make sure everyone feels confident on where IncoTerms 2020 stands now that they have been released. So in today's presentation, we're gonna start with a brief introduction of IncoTerms for those of us who are newer to dealing with them. Then we're gonna go through some of the things IncoTerms do versus some of the things that they do not do. Um, as there are many misconceptions here uh, that we found, we got some questions uh, prior to the webinar on that. Then we will jump into the IncoTerms 2020 by going through what has changed. And finally, we will have a few helpful resources to share with you all. So we do also have some pre-submitted questions, as I mentioned, that we're gonna go through at the end. You will also have an opportunity to submit your own questions today. However, since most uh, questions concerning IncoTerms are highly specific to your situation, we will be reaching out after the webina webinar to follow up with those. Okay, so let's get started with the basics and answer the question, what are IncoTerms? So IncoTerms stands for International Commercial Terms. They are a series of predetermined commercial terms that inform sales contracts by defining resp respective obligations, costs, and risks involved in the delivery of goods from seller to buyer. They are published by the International Chamber of Commerce, also known as the ICC, whose members include many of the world's leading companies, SMEs, business associations, and local chambers of commerce. The primary intention of IncoTerms uh, is to clearly communicate the task, tasks, costs, and risks associated with the transportation and delivery of goods. So why are these rules so important? Well, the most obvious reason is that they clearly, they clearly define the roles and responsibilities for both buyer and seller. This helps minimize any miscommunication on either side during the complicated process of moving goods uh, from one place in the world to another. Inco terms uh, are also translated into 27 different languages to make it easier for the international business community to all understand the same baseline agreement between parties. They are also accepted by governments, legal authorities, and practitioners worldwide. So they really, you know, give us all across the world kind of a common language to speak when it comes to, you know, doing business between buyer and seller. Now here at TRG, we are primarily we primarily deal with the marine cargo insurance piece of the supply chain puzzle. So how do these rules impact your transit in terms of cargo insurance? Well, knowing your Inco terms and using them correctly 
reduces the likelihood of disputes, misunderstandings, or hedging on either side. Ultimately, it is much harder to substantiate an insurance claim if you do not have an agreement of responsibilities in writing. Incoterms also help define those responsibilities quickly and clearly. A marine cargo insurance policy can only really legally uh, pay on goods that a policyholder has an insurable interest in. So if your contract says that the other party owns and is responsible for insuring the goods, then your cargo insurance policy is not able to pay that claim. Out of the 11 published rules, only two of them actually require one of the parties to provide a cargo insurance policy. Those two are CIF and CIP. We will get into a little more detail on those in a bit, but an important thing to note is that the rest of the rules do not require an insurance policy. They do, however, define who has the insurable interest up to a certain point in the transfer of goods. So what is insurable interest? Uh, it is the stake, uh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> it is the stake in the value of an entity or event for which an insurance policy is purchased to mitigate the risk of loss. So entities that are not subject to financial loss from an event uh, do not have an insurable interest and cannot purchase an insurance policy to cover that event. So whether or not you stand to suffer a financial loss depends on who owns the goods and who bears the risks. Insurance, or sorry, INCO terms define which of the parties bear the risk at certain points in the transfer of goods. So a lot of times if you, if you do have um, something happen to your goods while they're in transit and you go to, you know, make a claim on your marine cargo insurance policy, the first question a lot of times is what are your INCO terms and if you had insurable interest when that event took place. So this is just another reason why you really need to know your INCO terms before your good ship. So now let's get into what incoterms do versus what they do not do in the transit process. So we've actually received a couple questions um, on a few of these items, so I thought we should just kind of directly list them. Uh, incoterms do not address title transfer or revenue recognition. The transfer of title to the goods is part of the contract and can be specified in the contract regardless of what INCO terms are, have been used. Also, revenue recognition is a primary port point of interest for your accounting team and is not uh, stipulated as part of the chosen INCO term rule. INCO terms do not address payment terms. Payment terms are separate responsibilities meant to be defined within the contract. Whether you have established net 30 or net 60 or any other payment term, uh, that really has no bearing on your INCO term and it should be established within the contract between the buyer and seller as part of your negotiation. Also, INCO terms do not create legal effect by themselves and adding them onto a commercial invoice is not automatic protection. You can, however, create legal effect by writing them into a contract and having them agreed upon by both parties. So INCO terms are intended to clearly uh, to clarify the responsibilities between buyer and seller in relation to the transfer of goods, so they need to be agreed upon prior to the shipment leaving the foreign port. So, okay, so, so those are some of the things they do not do, but what do they do? Well, IncoTerm rules assign costs between buyer and seller. So within each fully written IncoTerm, there is a defined allocation of cost. As an example, this section may specify that the seller must pay all costs relating to the goods and their transport until they have been delivered to the named place of destination, while the buyer must pay for all costs relating to the goods from the time they have been delivered. So notice that in this example, payment terms are not established, but the responsibility to pay between the parties is. Inco terms also assign risk throughout the transfer of goods. This includes assigning who bears the risk of loss or damage and where in transit that risk transfers. Overall, they delegate responsibility between the buyer and seller. Now, INCO terms uh, can create legal effect when agreed upon and referenced in the contract. 
So remember to be as explicit as possible when necessary. It is important to establish rules during the contract negotiation phase. Again, these terms should be agreed upon by both parties, so it should be a component in your negotiation. If that is not possible, you need to at least agree, on, agree to them before the goods ship. Once the goods have shipped, responsibility should have already been established. The point of using these terms for your business is to secure the delivery method that is most favor favorable for your business. So there is no one size fits all situation here. The selected INCO term depends on your company's infrastructure and needs. INCO terms can also be used for quoting purposes during the initial phase of business. Some sellers will determine the price per unit based on the selected INCO term. For example, purchasing goods CIF may make the price per unit increase since the seller is legally required to provide insurance and freight. We ran through a full price comparison example in our previous webinar on INCO terms. Uh, so you can watch that to see exactly how this may impact your initial quotes. Um, we also have a blog post kind of illustrating this example as well that we will be including in the follow-up email to this, uh, to this webinar to kind of give you an idea of how that can shake out. Okay, so it's time to get into the main topic at hand, uh, INCO terms 2020. What what has changed? Uh, for a little more background, uh, the ICC amends INCO terms about every 10 years. These changes are based on trends in the international trade community, uh, shifting technologies, and feedback from business leaders. The previous version was INCO terms 2010, and the new version, INCO terms 2020, was released in September of 2019, and they took effect on January 1st of this year. So some of the reasons for the change in INCO terms is due to the fact that the ICC wants to maintain their relevance to the international trade community. So they make adjustments to the rules after looking at global economic trends, additional markets that have risen, uh, changes to security standards throughout major markets, insurance rates and coverage adjustments, uh, which is typically based on the goods or the transports, and increased calls for changes from the international trade community. So within you know the 10 years that those that version of INCO terms is in effect, they keep an eye on these trends and then make adjustments as they see fit. So a big question uh, that a lot of people have is, do you have to use the new terms? Um, the answer to that is a little bit of a yes and a little bit of a no. Ultimately, the ICC recommends that any contracts entered after uh, after the beginning of this year uh, should adhere to INCO terms 2020. However, ultimately, if both part parties in the contract agree to use the previous or a previous set of rules and stipulate that in their contract, that is fine. In fact, as long as it is specified, you can use INCO terms to 2000, INCO terms 2010. Um, or really any of the previous set of rules. The primary thing here is that both the buyer and the seller have agreed to their responsibilities and are on the same page. However, should arbitration or court proceedings take place, most officials expect to see INCO terms 2020 for agreements made after January 1st of this year. So if you are using a previous term, make sure that it is explicitly stated in that contract. Overall, it may take up to 12 to 18 months for the majority of the industry to switch over to INCO terms 2020. So there will be a bit of a time before everyone has kind of fully caught up to the changes. Um, so, you know, there is definitely kind of this year to get used to what has changed. All right, so now let's dive into a few of those changes. So the first one here is uh, about onboard uh, bills of lading in FCA. Uh, the fur this is kind of uh, an interesting one because it deals with a specific INCO term. Uh, under the previous INCO terms, parties and financiers required a bill of lading with onboard notation. But because FCA terms were technically fulfilled before the goods were loaded onto a vessel, it was difficult for the seller to obtain an onboard bill of lading. Under INCO terms 2020, buyers must instruct the carrier to provide an onboard bill of lading to the seller once goods are loaded. 
sellers will then issue the bill of lading to the buyer without taking on any additional obligation to the buyer within the terms of the contract. So this came as a result of increased calls from financiers for the onboard bills of lading. So number two, um, the previous iterations of uh, CIF and CIP uh, ma mandated that a minimum insurance coverage at clause C level of the institute cargo clauses um, had to be had to be uh, procured as part of their inco term or as part of their agreement. In the new version, CIF remains at the same level of minimum insurance, but it does allow parties to pursue higher levels of coverage. So what that means is that if you are using CIF as your inco term in your agreement, the seller is required to provide insurance as part of that inco term. However, they are only required to to provide the minimum level of insurance. So we get into more of what these actual insurance, if you're unfamiliar with cargo insurance, uh, what these different cargo clauses mean and what they cover in a previous webinar. And we have a lot of content on that. So if you have any questions, let us know. Um, but basically, if you get CIF, the understanding is that you're probably getting a insurance at the clause C level. So, um, this, the major change here is with CIP. So for CIP deliveries, seller now, sellers must now obtain an insurance coverage at clause A level, meaning the insurance level has increased to benefit the buyer. However, both parties may agree to lower or higher levels of insurance coverage. So really, this is kind of the bigger change here is on the CIP level. CIF has not changed, um, but CIP, you would now get cargo clause A. All right, so number three here, um, under 2010 rules, the assumption was that a third party carrier would be responsible for transporting goods between the buyer and the seller. So a change here is that um, in the 2020 guidelines, the rules allow for transportation owned by either the buyer or the seller uh, in FCA, DAP, DPU, and DDP. So Incoterms 2020 also establishes stronger security requirements in accordance with changes made by customs officials and major international traders. Uh, these obligations will come into effect in the carriage and export slash import clearance sections of each rule, but the costs for these obligations will be featured in the allocation of costs between buyer and seller of each rule. In Incoterm 2020, all costs related to the sale are now listed in the allocation of costs under each specific guideline and under each relevant article to which they pertain. So by including these within the guidelines and articles themselves, users can see a complete list in a single place and help both buyers and sellers minimize confusion. So what this is really referring to is the actual Incoterm guidebook itself uh, in the in past iterations, it was a little less clear who was responsible for the cost of what part. Um, it was kind of it wasn't called out as clearly in the new guideline or in the new guidebook. It is now very clear they actually have an allocation of cost in both the buyer and the seller section, as well as under the specific responsibilities themselves. So they're just. I mean, this really just pertains to if you've bought the guidebook, which we'll get into in a little bit, but this is a pretty helpful change if you are somebody that gets the guidebook. So probably one of the most significant changes for Incoterms 2020 is changing DAT to DPU. So DAT, which stood for Delivery at Terminal, has been changed to DPU, which stands for Delivered at Place Unloaded, to provide a broader understanding of where goods have been placed. While goods could still certainly be delivered to a terminal, not every place is referred to as a terminal. Uh, so this was just really meant to clarify uh, that it didn't have to be um, specifically a terminal. Uh, other than the name change, the functionality of this term has pretty much stayed the same. Uh, so if DAT was something you were using in the past, it should have pretty little effect on your actual practices other than the fact that now it is called DPU. 
might surprise you, but those are really the only big changes when it comes to Incoterms 2020. Um, every 10 years when they release these new rules, sometimes there's quite a few changes, sometimes there's really not that many. And this, this new iteration, um, most of the changes were just kind of on how things were worded, how things were organized within the guidebook. Um, and other than the insurance change between CIF and CIP, and then the change from DAT to DPU, those are really the two biggest changes that I think are, you know, really going to affect the buyer, um, well, the buyer and the seller, uh, when it comes to the practice of income terms. Okay, so now let's, uh, we have a few resources to recommend for you in the event that you want to learn more about income terms. The first one should come as no surprise, as we've been <laughs> mentioning it quite a few times now. Um, but this is really the best place to get the most information concerning IncoTerms. The ICC publishes an official guide for every new version of IncoTerms. So this guide contains the most in-depth breakdown of every rule. However, it does come at a cost. Uh, this almost 200 page book costs about 60 US dollars. It can be purchased through the official ICC website. However, it can be difficult to purchase through there. Um, when we bought our copy here at TRG, we did have some issues with ordering through their site and ended up finding that ICC had it listed on Amazon. So after three weeks and a few back and forth emails with customer service, uh, we were able to solve our problem with two day Amazon shipping. Uh, just to make sure the, that you get the book, uh, get the correct book, make sure that the um, ISBN on the, on the listing is the same to ensure that it is the official IncoTerms 2020 guide. So you can see on the slide here that ISBN, um, just kind of copy that down or you know we can include it in our email, our follow-up email, just to make sure that you get the correct book. There are definitely some other guides out there that maybe don't have the same amount of information. So the ICC has also released an app for IncoTerms 2020. Um, it is free to download and is available for both Apple and Android phones. Just search IncoTerms 2020 in your app store and make sure that it is the ICC official app, which it'll just have, it'll have the ICC's uh, logo on there. Uh, while the app is good for getting a quick reference of each definition, ultimately it will refer you to the official full guide for more information. Um, to be honest, it ultimately does kind of seem like the majority of the app's intent is to push more people toward their paid resources. However, it is good for a quick overview of each Inco term. It does have all 11 in there uh, with a quick uh, definition of responsibility as well as a very simple um, visual guide as well for each Inco term. Now, as a free resource, uh, TRG has we have updated our IncoTerms desk reference. Uh, this is a free download that contains an overview of each IncoTerm with comparison charts as well in the back. This guide is meant to help you get an overall understanding while also giving you something easy to refer to on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can type out that link that's on the screen right now to download it. Uh, we will also be including this in our follow-up email so that you can all download this. All right, now let's get to a few of the pre-submitted questions that we got. Um, during this time, please submit your, your questions as well, uh, since, I mean, kind of like I know, mentioned before, a lot of your questions might be more so specific to your unique situation. For those, we will be reaching out afterward, after the webinar to follow up. All right, so the first question, how are these, IncoTerms, linked to goods valuation for customs purposes? Well, it really depends on which IncoTerm rule you used. So typically, when determining the valuation of goods for customs purposes, the cost of freight and insurance are not included in that calculation. However, that portion of the cost needs to be clearly separated out for customs. If you are importing goods and using a term that puts the responsibility of freight and or insurance on the buyer, or sorry, yeah, on the buyer, then these line items would be clearly broken out and will not be included in the valuation of goods. However, in some cases, that responsibility of freight or insurance is placed on the seller. That seller might include those costs in the 
price of the items, um, maybe even the unit price, so the price per unit. This means that those line items would be included in the valuation of goods. So what does that mean? Uh, the valuation of your goods is used to calculate the duty amount for that commodity. Therefore, if the cost of freight and insurance is included in the price of goods, you will be paying duties on your freight and insurance cost. These two items would typically not be considered uh, in the valuation. They would be considered non-dutable non -dutiable cost. So make sure that you consider this during the negotiation phase with the seller. You can also request that the seller break out the cost of freight and insurance on the commercial invoice. Um, in order to do this, you must have a rated bill of lading from the steamship line or the NVOCC and notify your broker of the correct customs value to report. Uh, we, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but we have um, a blog post that kind of runs through an example of this, specifically talking about CIF versus FOB. Um, a lot of times when you get a quote from a seller, uh, particularly we've seen this a lot with um, Alibaba orders, you can get a price per unit that they call the CIF price. This price per unit includes the cost of insurance and freight in the price per unit. You can request to get a different cost, so you can ask for the FOB price or the um, XWorks price to get kind of more the raw cost of that price per unit since they would not be paying for insurance and freight for those. Um, but we ran through a comparison in this blog post to kind of show you how that might break down in your end cost per year. Well, per shipment and then per year. All right, so another question that we got are what are the pros and cons of, and then insert term. We got a lot of these questions on different INCO terms, and then if you know if they benefit the buyer or the seller more. So this really is the million dollar question. Uh, the ultimate answer is that it highly depends on the infrastructure of your business. Um, these terms are so specific to what your business is able to able to do as well as you know what you want to deal with as well so we're going to just look at a few the few that we're going to look at are ones that we got specific questions on um, but we're going to be looking at them all from the perspective of the buyer since i believe that most of the people on this webinar are would have that position would be the buyer so ddp delivered duty paid under ddp the seller undertakes all responsibilities until the goods are delivered at the named place of delivery this is as hands-off as it can get for the buyer so the pros is ultimately no work for the buyer the cons of this one is that not all sellers can perform customs clearance responsibilities your bill is going to have many built-in costs that will affect your buying price and often including plenty of additional buffer to account for the seller's unknown cost. So the idea, or ultimately, GDP sounds great on paper for the buyer, but it can be a problem in practice. You're more likely to have your goods delayed or pay heavily for the convenience of being hands-off. So the answer to the question, does this benefit the buyer or seller more, is it places all of the responsibility on the seller and allows the buyer to be mostly hands-off in the process. So if you are a business that maybe doesn't have the infrastructure to take care of a lot of you know, the customs clearance responsibilities and all of that, this might be the INCO term for you. However, if you've had issues in the past with this one, this might be wise because the seller just might not be as versed with dealing with the customs, with the US customs clearance process. All right, so DPU, delivered at place unloaded. Under DPU, the buyer has the customs clearance responsibilities and any on carriage from the named place to their door. The seller retains pre-carriage and, and on carriage uh, responsibilities. This is the only INCO term that the uh, INCO term rule seller that specifies unloading responsibilities for the seller, which would be inclusive of most terminal handling charges, uh, THCs. So the pros is it's very light responsibilities for the buyer, uh, maybe only customs clearance. The cons is unloading is not customary in all cases, uh, nor necessarily navig navigable for many sellers. 
Uh, this term is particularly relevant where the destination is a terminal or CFS where the goods are being dropped and the buyer will simply pick it up. So this one also places the majority of the responsibility on the seller while leaving customs clearance in the control of the buyer. So this one may be the right choice if you as a buyer, um, if, if unloading is not an issue for you as a buyer. So FCA, free carrier. Under FCA, the buyer is accepting the costs and risks of main carriage and on carriage. The seller delivers goods when they reach the named point of destination. So the pros is you have full control over most of the delivery process, allowing you to troubleshoot where necessary. You also control carrier selection for main carriage, which represents the primary costs and delay risks. Uh, commercial invoice price often aligns one-to-one -one with customs value, um, which is kind of what we talked about before, um, having your, your freight and everything broken out. Uh, cons is you accept more risk during transit and will have more to arrange. Good relationships with freight forwarders and steamship lines become critical at this point. So um, as for this one, it, if it benefits the buyer or seller more, this rule frequently prefer, is frequently preferred for buyers with sensitive timing and production cycles or those with a reliable infrastructure to manage transport. So potentially massive direct and indirect cost savings opportunities with well-managed process, um, especially for high volume shippers. So because you would be getting your own quotes for freight, um, you, you know, potentially can save more money there. So Xworks, uh, with Xworks, the seller places the cargo for pickup at their facility and the rest is on you as the buyer. So the pros is that you gain full control over the entire transportation cycle. The cons is that you assume the responsibilities of export clearance in the foreign country, which might be a challenge even for the most savvy of buyers. So this rule can benefit the buyer if they are very savvy with the entire supply chain process. Having control of the entire process can lead to an additional cost savings and a more predictable timeline. However, since the responsibility is fully on you as the buyer, there's generally more upfront work when using this term. All right, so those were kind of the top few that we got questions on um, that we wanted to kind of quickly go through. Um, the next question uh, specifically talked about the INCO term free domicile. Uh, when can that be used? Is it the same as DDP? Uh, this one I actually had to kind of look up separately because free domicile is not an official INCO term anymore. Um, it is basically still widely used as a pricing term to describe when the shipper pays all the applicable duties and all the transportation and other charges until delivered to the buyer's premises. So it is equivalent to the INCO term rule DDP, delivered at duty paid, delivered duty paid. Okay, so those are all the questions that we were able to get a pretty concise answer to at this time. Again, if you have any additional questions, please submit them. We will be following up with, with all of them um, and hopefully be able to help everybody out here as we can. So now um, I'm gonna go quickly over some of, you know, a little bit more about trade risk guarantee. So we sell directly to consumers. Uh, so rather than purchasing through a third party, we're gonna help you out by letting you buy direct. Uh, this is marine cargo insurance, obviously. Uh, and that gives you an option for lower pricing and very competitive customer service and claims assistance. All of our policies are written through the Lloyds of London or XL Catlin markets. Now Lloyds of London is the largest insurance market in the world. They created cargo insurance. Uh, XL Catlin is a domestic provider that enables us to underwrite amazing policies at a low price. Now we offer local representation. Uh, we have a on-site team, uh, you might have heard Felicia in some past webinars or videos. Um, if you contact us about a loss, you're gonna be speaking directly to Felicia and her team. But that does not mean that we can't handle a loss anywhere. We have represent representatives around the world ready to help in the case of a loss to make sure you get paid the right amount quickly. Finally, our policies are custom. We offer all three international, domestic, and warehouse coverage and they are wrapped around your business. These are not blanket policies. These are not off the shelf policies. 
These are policies written directly for you based on your business, making sure you have the coverage you need. Our annual all risk policies start at some of the lowest annual costs in the market. We start at 750 a year. Typically the insurance market premiums are starting at around uh, $2,500 to $5,000 a year. Uh, we did this, we pioneered the specific pricing model to help out importers of all sizes, not just those that ship millions of dollars a year. We want to make sure that even the importer that does a hundred to 300,000 can buy a policy that covers that. All right, well, that's all for our webinar. I'm gonna pass it over to Nick to kind of wrap this up. Thanks, Meredith. Thank everyone for attending. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us at marketing at Trade Risk Guarantee. Um, also, don't forget, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and most importantly on YouTube. If you check the chat window, I dropped a subscribe link in there. So if you want to be notified the moment this releases, I would highly recommend subscribing. Thanks again.